All right, let's do this. Hey yo, what is up everyone? It is the Alpha J of the Alpha J Show, and this is probably gonna take a while. This is the big one, and no, not the big 5-0, but the biggest verses I have and probably will do in a very long time. Just like with the Pickle and Peanut trilogy, or the three-way verses of Teen Titans Go, these things take time. But I love doing them, don't get me wrong. And this is something that unfortunately, only some people know. So let me explain. Spongebob, like The Simpsons, has been going on for a long time. So it's bound to make a mistake here or an inconsistency there. But recycling entire plots? Well, that's another thing. However, this particular plot point has been done to death. This plot point is Plankton disguises himself as X to get the formula. Please note that this isn't the same as Plankton trying to get the formula. That plot point can be done much more because that's really one of the main plot points of the show. However, with both, there is one thing you must do with the future episodes that use either of these plot points. You have to make them interesting. These four episodes are pretty much the same. Someone's in the kitchen with Sandy, Grandma's Secret Recipe, Shellback Shenanigans, and the latest one coming out of season nine, Married to money. Are they interesting variants of the same idea? Well, let's check it out. For simplicity, I'm going to split up each episode into the following. The opening scenes, the scenes before the disguise, also known as the pre-disguise scenes, the actual scene involving the disguise, getting into the Krusty Krab or anything else that happens in the episode, how it fails, and then the last few scenes, the conclusion. All episodes below pretty much have the same structure. Some will meander from this plot point in a way, and I'll adjust as such. At the end, I'll give you which episode did the best and the worst and really everything in between. So sit back and let's start off this versus. So we start off with someone's in the kitchen with Sandy. The episode starts off with Plankton in a Krabby Patty bun. And I gotta stop this episode right here. So Plankton is smart enough to get close enough to be entrapped in a bun, but not smart enough to be in a safe or whatever the formula is to get it. We've seen Plankton is capable of getting into the Krusty Krab extremely easy ever since the Krusty Krab training video. This is not not news. Even think about this in terms of cartoon logic. Even back to the old, old, old shows like Coyote and Roadrunner. When Coyote's running off a cliff, he gets the realization that he's no longer running on the land, and then he falls. So why is post-movie Plankton so stupid? Where is his moment of realization? I know this seems like a ridiculously small plot point to rant over, but again, the opening affects the middle, which affects the end, and if this is how good they start off, you better bet in the later seasons, it doesn't really get better. But let me give this episode the benefit of the doubt and continue. So Spongebob grabs conveniently the tray that just so happens to have Plankton lodged into this random sea. I love to see what would have happened if Spongebob grabbed the wrong tray, or even better, if he grabbed every single tray instead of the one that has Plankton on it. And to those who would raise the argument that what I would suggest that would be contrived, look at what they did. Perfect, he's headed for the front door. Now's the time to make my exit. Or he's uh heading towards a customer. I'm sorry, but I don't know what's frustratingly worse. In Little Yellow Book, where Squidward was reading Spongebob's diary in his boat, where the front walls of the Krusty Krab was made out of glass, and Spongebob had to, in the most contrived and idiotic way, look away from Squidward to start a story and still talk to him. Or Plankton somehow getting into the Krusty Krab and opting to get into a bun instead of going directly for the formula, and getting lucky that Spongebob was take the right tray and make a Krabby Patty only to waste it by going out the front door. Maybe it's just me, so I'm gonna move on. So Spongebob makes a Krabby Patty for his special friend. Chalk this up to your Sandy Bob shipping for the select few of you. The water of Bikini Bottom decides to stand still while Sandy flashes her special friend, Spongebob, and she takes the patty into her suit. Plankton, not having any air, wonder where that water could have come from, passes out as Sandy eats. Honestly, for an opener, it's really mediocre. I wouldn't consider it terrible or bad because as an overall look, it does have everything down that it needs to have, like Plankton having a reason to be associated with Sandy. Although, I'm a betting man, and I bet Perfect Chemistry has a better opener than this. So it's not like they can't do one better. So let us now move on to Grandma's Secret Recipes opening. This episode starts off at Shady Shoals. Plankton is shown caring about his grandmother. Now, if you want me to be honest, I do enjoy small amounts of character development that is outside the norm. Believe it or not, I did enjoy Sandy's intro in the fishbowl. Plankton is feeding his grandmother chocolate pudding. He is also socializing with her, and I can't help but feel like the mentality of Plankton's grandmother is the same as for Squidward's grandmother in this episode here. The scene features a pretty 
funny joke. I'm liking the first few scenes so far. This opening is rather short because the pre-disguise is pretty much in the same time span, so to speak. So I want to start this off positive. Also love the production music of this scene. This opener is much better than Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy because it doesn't insult my intelligence. Also because of what's to come, the perspective that they chose to take made a good surprise when I first saw this episode. So let us move on to Shellback Shenanigans opening scenes. This episode opens to a very beautiful evening at the Krusty Krab. We see the always happy Spongebob talking to Mr. Krabs. The only thing eventful to come out of this is Spongebob wants to feed Gary a Krabby Patty and Mr. Krabs wants Squidward as a pet. Secretly. The opening is very relaxed and the dialogue flows very well. There isn't much of a problem here from what I see. We see that Spongebob cares enough to feed his pet, which is always a plus. We also see that Mr. Krabs is still playing his cheap role, which is unfortunately not a plus in this case. Now all of this flows much better than the previous two episodes, which is fantastic for me. I don't ask for perfection, I just ask that things make some type of sense. A joke here, a plot point here, and I'm happy. Simple. So we get to pretty much the next scene where Plankton and Karen stretch time a bit, but do somewhat well with their time. It's kind of strange. The back and forth is solid, I suppose. I should at least be grateful that they're trying to advance the plot. What? I said what he just say. He said what? I have no idea. That's why I'm asking you what he just said. I know that, and I'm saying he said what? I know that. We... Oh, he said what? Yes! Multiple writers, ladies and gentlemen. You know, Spongebob, <laughs> might not be such a good idea bringing a dirty snail into the kitchen. You can't change that baby out here in front of the customers. Take him in back where the food is prepared. That feeling when your episodes line up in a way that this cannot be avoided. So now we get to Married to Money's opening scenes. So Married to Money starts off with the Bikini Bottomites running away from the Krusty Krab. Just like with the fishbowl, the assets just look different to me. I might do a video on this. So Plankton decides to train a few sea bears to terrorize the Krusty Krab. Bonus points that the crew decide to bring back animals that they used before. All is lost for Mr. Krabs, but before he is torn to shreds, Spongebob, without a circle, not only distracts the wild beasts, but lures them away from the Krusty Krab. Small question, so how did they get in just fine in the first place. Since Mr. Krabs was seconds away from death and didn't contribute to his own rescuing, he's much more angry than usual. He brings up that if you mess with his restaurant, you mess with his money, which is something logical and something I can get behind. And that's pretty much the opening scenes from Married to Money. So from what I can tell, Grandma's Secret Recipe and Shellback Shenanigans have strong openings for different reasons. Grandma's Secret Recipe starts off with a strong surprise while introducing the disguise, catalyst for the plot, and Plankton's grandmother. The opening scenes are very sweet but also have a bit of comedy wedged in and feature some of the best scenes of the entire episode. Shellback Shenanigans opts for a more dialogue heavy and relaxed sort of stick. I love how the dialogue flows natural in a show on a network that believes that children in general use the words cray cray, selfie, and duck lips on a regular day. The jokes here also work very well and feature some great setups. Married to Money is decent. I like the sea bear attack scenes because at least it's fresh and doesn't just start off as a regular day in the Krusty Krab. As we know, Spongebob isn't live action, so more out of the box situations are not only welcome, not only encouraged, but if done right, could be met with praise. So I praise it here. I also like the performance of Mr. Krabs in this opening scene. Someone's in the kitchen with Sandy opted for a very contrived and dull opening. I don't understand how Plankton materializes in the Krusty Krab. This can be explained, but in this episode it wasn't. Also, his plan was bankrupt from the beginning, and just like later on with Grandma's Secret Recipe, Plankton's planning really needs some improvement. So now we get back to Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy, and the scenes that lead up to the disguise. We start back at Sandy's tree dome. Nothing truly interesting comes about until we see Sandy pretty much washing herself. Which, I'm not even gonna comment on it. And to get this stinky thing off. Boy, that's right. Okay, pause. Let's not talk about the fact that she has two bras on. Let's not talk about the fact that she opts to wash her fur and herself separate. Why can she do this? Why is this a thing? Can someone explain why she needed to do this? In the grand scheme of the plot, all this does is make the plot work in the most lackluster form. Have you ever tried washing dishes with your elbows? Would that be a challenge? Yes. Would it be worthwhile to do? 
No, just because something can be a conflict doesn't mean that it should. But some positivity. I do think that Plankton imitating Sandy can have some great potential. And you know the place to go if you want me to put my money where my mouth is. I do understand that the fur is needed for Plankton to get off the appearance of Sandy, but my issue is that it doesn't really work. Why? Well, let's continue. So somehow water gets into Plankton's bowl, and the next shot immediately shows why that would be impossible. But it does get Plankton into the next shot, which like I said with the opener, is exactly all we really require. What in Neptune's ocean is that repulsive thing? You see how Plankton is disgusted by how a furless Sandy looks? Keep this in mind. So throughout the shower peeping, Plankton notices her fur and gets an idea on how to get the formula. He's going to somehow use her fur as a disguise. Also, you know how we come to SpongeBob for some form of comedy or some form of storytelling? There isn't any comedy. Unless you consider laughing at a furless squirrel comedy, this is pretty much exactly what these first two minutes have to offer. Which is why instead of repeatedly saying how the opening is below average and how Plankton doesn't really seem compelling, I talk about the smaller things. Like Plankton slamming the door as hard as he can and Sandy not hearing it. So if you're wondering exactly why I haven't talked about any form of humor, that's because it's either too flat to acknowledge or just simply not there at all. So let me get my mind off this and let's go on to the scenes before the disguise of grandma's secret recipe. Ah, back to the lovely scene of Plankton with his grandmother. Oh, oh my. Okay, look. I'm no Mr. Clean, but I wouldn't put someone's dentures into my mouth, let alone without washing them. Also in this scene, Plankton's grandmother falls asleep and Plankton tells her to get up and take out her teeth and then she's back to falling asleep. It took me one sentence to explain it and it took them too long to actually do. So an evil laugh and sinister music later, we get a flashback to Plankton's idea on how taking the formula is going to go down. However, Mr. Krabs is at the cashier's spot, which doesn't really make all that much sense to me. Is the episode trying to say that this is what's going to happen, or is Plankton getting crucial details wrong about who works there at the Krusty Krab? I know this is gonna sound crazy, coming from someone who literally is reviewing four shows of the same premise, and is very paranoid about this going over an hour. But this scene is really overcomplicating a simple task. Get the formula. Get the Krabby Patty. I understand adding layers to your episodes make them interesting and last longer. I've done multiple episodes pretty much supporting that fact. But the layers have to make sense. Sure, I can wash dishes with my elbows, like I said before. That would be a challenge, but why? I don't understand why simply buying the Krabby Patty as his grandmother would work better. I don't buy it. Even for those who use the fallacy that it's just for kids, you should at least agree that simplicity in cartoons is usually much more beneficial. Now, I'm not saying brevity because the points that this episode wants to cover should be covered, but metaphorically speaking, instead of taking five steps forward and then two steps back, why not just take three steps forward? Also, what I fail to really suspend my disbelief for is that not only does Plankton not disguise his voice, but Mr. Krabs in Plankton's daydream is willing to help the elderly even before a transaction is made. I just realized that this episode is trying to tell me that Mr. Krabs would be willing to give his recipe to a grandmother for free, but not take any witch's money because she was only one short. Now I could chalk this up to Plankton just getting things wrong blatantly, but the thing is that he is supposed to be the evil genius, or at least smarter than the average bottom feeder. Moving on, Spongebob is seen bathing before he gets a knock on the door. I do want to stop here for tension. I think these scenes are okay. I don't know why, but his reaction while walking wet down the stairs was priceless. Wait, wait. I think I need to reword that. All right, he's a sponge, okay? Anyway, let's move on to the scenes before the disguise and shell back shenanigans. So we get Gary pretty much not wanting to take a bath. <clears throat> Pet sitter Pat and Gary takes a bath for calling. They want their, uh, what's the point? SpongeBob attempts to get Gary to bathe. It is a very important plot point that Gary does not want to bathe. In fact, they go straight on to the next scene quickly, which unlike in the previous episode, here works very well. I am five minutes into this episode and I feel as though I've only watched like two minutes. I guess this is why SpongeBob is so easy to review. That and the fact that they do the same episode multiple times, which is why this video was made. Good morning, sir. 
My name is Sheldon R. Shell Cleaner, owner and operator of Super Shell Cleaner Vacations Unlimited. That isn't the main disguise here. Still pre-disguised scenes. He performs his role really well. I'm not blowing back, but again, all of this is solid. He explains that he wants to put Gary on a vacation while he takes the shell and he takes the metaphorical bath bullet for him. One thing I do like is how his speech is clearly offering much more to Gary than to him to make the deal look a lot sweeter. The outcome would have been very different if he went into the conversation with the intention of getting something for himself first, like the shell. It does make Plankton look like the cartoon mastermind he used to be. His lines in this part work super well. In fact, I would dare say I would have bought this if I was a snail. So let's move on to the scenes before the main disguise of Married to Money. Well, if you love money so much, why don't you marry it? Plankton, act your age not your height. But more importantly, playground insults? I bet someone was in the writing room and just said that, and all the other writers were like, wow, all the kids are gonna be saying that, except that it's not 1995 anymore. But I'm gonna give them a pass because, albeit, it's a short way to get right into the catalyst for the plot, so I can give them a pardon for the cliche. Mr. Krabs sinks into a depression because he can't find love, which is weird because of another episode in season nine. Everything he does, now he has this perspective that he's doing it alone. Mr. Krabs in love is usually weird, just like Squidward in love. I'm not really sure why. Maybe it's because he's just depicted to love money and never depicted to be self-aware that he's a single father running a restaurant on borderline criminal procedures and has a lot of money, not wanting to spend it or share it on anyone or anything. But maybe it's just me. So as he's moping, he hears a woman sobbing quite loud. Running over to her, we can see that she's a pile of money. Literally. Let's not get too ahead of ourselves here. I know that Plankton said that he had an idea in the opening scene, but who knows? Maybe this will be a surprise. Oh, careful now, careful. Your ink will run. <laughs> My, he's such a gentleman. Hey, if I met the scallywag that stood you up, I'd knock him down. <laughs> My knight and shining exoskeleton. Come on, Plankton. Give Krabs a little chase now. Again, they do nail the interaction. I'm not expecting anything on the level of a romance novel. I'm not even expecting anything on the level of a Steven Universe episode. What they did here works, but also makes watching and rewatching this fun. I enjoyed this part and rewatching it again, I notice a lot more subtleties. I love how Mr. Krabs just wants to act cool and look cool. He's always trying to look and act younger when in love. Needless to say, this pile of cash, also known as Kashina, plays her role well. A lot of this, I don't want to spoil. So let's move on. So overall, Married to Money definitely takes the winner here. The conversations held were magnificent for a SpongeBob episode, and I feel like it can rival other Mr. Krabs romance episodes. The mood was very lovely. I think Shellback Shenanigans comes at a far, far second because although the second half of the pre-disguise was gold, the first part dragged on with useless filler. Plankton as a salesperson is not something new, but so far, it has been working and working well. The scenes in Shellback Shenanigans are just dull, minus the Plankton ones obviously. I think someone's in the kitchen with Sandy and Grandma's secret recipe tie for a very, very far third because both of them require a functioning brain to see why they don't work, in my opinion. They have giant inconsistencies, and if the beginning starts off bad, it sets the mood for the rest of the episode, which is why we have beginning scenes. Grandma's Secret Recipe featured a ridiculous scene thought up by Plankton. I would have given this episode the worst of the four, but luckily this is all in Plankton's head, which doesn't excuse it, it only cushions the blow. In terms of someone's in the kitchen with Sandy, well, the scenes where Plankton wakes up are frustrating, and easy to fix. Some parts are confusing and others could have been left off altogether. We also see the seeds planted for the portrayal of a furless Sandy, which leads to more stuff down the road. So now let us go on to the disguised scenes of these four episodes. So as we come back to Plankton's in the contrivance with Sandy, Karen gets in some squirrel jokes, no pun intended, as well as represent the audience, giving her husband no faith at all in this idea. So as they cut back to Sandy, she then realizes that her fur is missing. After not hearing Plankton drag the fur off while her helmet crashes onto the floor, or again, the infamous slam that was so loud, Sandy didn't hear it. She then realizes that someone has locked her out of her own bathroom and kicks the door down. 
I can tell that she's angry. Why don't I feel compelled to see her win? I just realized that this is a bathroom door that locks on the outside. Meaning that if you go into the bathroom, you cannot lock it. You have to have the faith that no one is going to open the bathroom door and see you using the bathroom or taking a shower because the lock is on the outside. What even is this bathroom door? Some low life varmint stole my things and broke into my home. My home. I'm honestly convinced that your ears are the equivalent to a tomato. No, not because tomatoes can't hear, but because they're so disabled, I don't know whether to classify them as a fruit or a vegetable. So Plankton pretty much gets this disguise up and running. And by up and running, I mean the equivalent of the two smaller people, one big coat gag. Plankton, in Sandy's body, runs into Larry. You don't look so good. Hey, you gotta stop eating at the chum bucket. That stuff will rot your insides. You eat living worms for raw protein. I don't think anyone should come to you for underwater nutrition advice. But the interaction of people with Sandy, both the character and the disguise, is pretty much the highlight of this episode. The episode will feature a lot of this, which is why I don't want to talk about it all here. Because when we come back, I just want to talk about something that has been on my mind when it comes to the treatment of Sandy. Overall, this point of disguise was average. Of my concerns, none of them truly take me away from the viewing experience or seeing this in a truly negative light. This was short, but it's only a few scenes for each disguise scene, so let us continue. So we're back at Grandma's Secret Recipe, where SpongeBob is approaching the door after being interrupted from his filler bath. Who would be at the door other than Plank, <clears throat> I mean Spongebob's great Grammy Ma. The next few scenes pretty much establish that Spongebob is not only extremely happy, but proud to be with his newly met great Grammy Ma. For brevity, I'm just gonna say Grammy Ma. So Grammy Ma wants to get straight into business. She wants the formula, but Spongebob being the ignorant dope that he is, would much rather comfort her like one would do for their Grammy Ma. I assume. Remember when I said earlier in this video that I like character development? Well, too much character development can look like filler. And this is filler. And it pretty much stretches out during this portion of the episode. Unless you see the humor in Plankton looking at photo albums and his reactions, you won't really find anything interesting here. So then we have both of them falling asleep. SpongeBob wakes up as if he had a nightmare, and Plankton can't believe what he's doing. Oh! the most horrible dream of my life. I was dressed up as only Mother and Neptune, it's true. That wasn't Plankton. That was Doug Lawrence's live thoughts being fed to Viacom. So I will stop here because the next parts will highlight Grammy Ma's attempts to get into the Krusty Krab. Overall, this was a whole lot of nothing. It was filler upon filler upon filler and really wasn't funny, inspiring, entertaining, or anything other than SpongeBob's pretty much spending his time with his Grammy Ma like one normally would. Unfortunately, it was still very dull and uninspiring. So as we return to Shellback shenanigans, we see that the plan has worked because Gary does want to switch. While all of this is happening, SpongeBob prepares the bath, the one that Gary avoided yesterday. So now Plankton is taking that bath that Gary dodged. During this process, Spongebob washes the shell of a Plankton with himself. In the process, Plankton's screams of agony make Spongebob cleaning come to a halt. The interaction of Plankton and Spongebob here is better, so I can at least praise that. Curses! I mean, meow. I've never felt better. I mean... Meow? Head hospital? But what about the fresh batch of Krabby Patties? I mean, meow! Fortunately, they do know when a joke has overstayed its welcome, and they stop. But it was pretty funny the few times it was actually on screen. SpongeBob is quick to see that his pet Gary doesn't really look like his pet Gary. He looks like a green, talking, sick son of a sponge. Which is why he takes the shell of a plankton to the pet hospital. When he gets there, this nurse deserves an award. These screams that she has this reaction you know let me just show you this is 11 out of 10 like would panic again and you know why because she sees this sick quote-unquote snail meow <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll have what she's having. This also moves us to one of the best jokes of the episode involving Plankton and a Karen lookalike, which I don't want to fully spoil. This part moves much faster. I know for these episodes, I don't really talk about pacing, and I'm not sure if I can. When I watch these episodes, I watch them at a rapid rate, and I notice that at the 7 minute mark, I don't feel as though I've watched 7 minutes of good quality content. This disguised scene is better than Grandma's Secret Recipe, but someone's in the kitchen with Sandy was at least more varied and interesting at this specific part. The doctor then alerts the snail that tests are going to be done on him, and they say it's only going to hurt for a short while. With my recent surgical process, it's never only going to hurt for a short while, you just deal with it now, because the pain would be 10 times worse if you wait later. Just a minor comment. I like this following scene with the doctor. Basically the doctor's role is to be the snarky but still professional doctor. Spongebob's paranoia is perfect here. This is his snail, his best friend. He loves Gary, whether he shows it or not. The way that he can't even sit is just such a great touch. He breaks into tears before the doctor can say what he really wants to say. Also, before anyone points this out, yes, I can have standards when it comes to disguises. In The Mighty Bee, Bessie was turned into a cat in front of Happy and Ben, yet Happy never treated it that way, despite having the mental capacity to do so. Bessie's mother was around a fake cat suit and sneeze, which I couldn't fully get behind. And lastly, you can't compare the intelligence of humans to the bikini bottomites. One we all know is known for being a little late to the punch, and the other practices sash throwing for the metaphorical symbol of being free and proud. And then we get this scene, and if you've seen it once, it's burned into the back of your brain, and if you have paranoia about bigger pills, don't watch this. Now open wide. That wasn't so bad, was it? That's not good. I'm not squeamish, but that is something I could have gone the rest of my life without seeing. Now mind you, they have done this before on other episodes, but here, Mr. Krabs is not only an adult, but it wasn't as dark as they made it here. We are two minutes until the end of this episode. So can we get to the Krusty Krabs soon, please? So they raise the sad music and have SpongeBob and the nurse talk about the passing of a pet. I do feel bad that SpongeBob has to go through this, but the tension is essentially not really there because we know that's not going to happen. What am I supposed to feel? Happy? Sad? Cause I do know I'm feeling like moving past this episode soon. Of course Spongebob is sad. And Plankton, finally, after 9 minutes, brings this all the way back to the formula. Which honestly, now we know is going to be underdone. Because there's only 2 minutes left. But who knows? Maybe they'll surprise me. Or maybe this will end in the same way that all other bad post-movie Spongebob episodes will end. So now, let us move on to the Married to Money disguise scenes. I have had to split the crabs, Kashina, love talking to two because we don't know it's Plankton until well the camera zooms in and we see Plankton pretty much saying what the plot is going to be to the audience like it does in all of the other three episodes. I'm not sure if it's clever or simple minded that Krabs took Puff and Plankton to the same restaurant. I guess this time he knows what he's spending except that he's not spending anything. Because according to the previous scene, he asks Kashina to spend the money. <laughs> Does anybody want me to review Lady and the Tramp? I, I feel like my time would be better served there. But I guess Spongebob isn't the first to do the whole spaghetti thing. Does it even work in real life? Honestly, with the like so much Mary cliche and now this, and the whole crabs picking up Kashina's act, a lot of this is stale. And to be honest, the only reason why I don't want to harp on this so much is because unlike in Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy and Grandma's Secret Recipe, this works and is something we have not truly seen before. This is much more fleshed out. However, they used a lot of cliches to help them, including the kissing with literal sparks cliche. Remind me, why does this show need a 10th 
and 11th season. If it's ninth season, it's using things that is old as the ninth century. Let me be clear. Just because it's a cliche doesn't mean it doesn't work. However, just because it works doesn't mean it isn't cliche. It's just average, uninspiring, but solid. One more positive though, I appreciate the gradual pushing of getting the formula to Crab's obvious ignorance. It's much better than the time where Plainton decided to drop the question cold in front of Crab's mother out of nowhere. As soon as I rewatched this, after putting it aside for a few months, I forgot Pearl is in here. Spoiler alert, I'm gonna have a field day with Pearl. <laughs> Are you kissing a locket with a woman's picture in it? Gross! You know, as someone who reviews things that, from the company's perspective, never really asks me to critique, I'm kind of triggered by Pearl's barging in and pretty much critiquing Mr. Krabs for being in love. What does Pearl have going on in her life that's so important? But seriously, her role here is pretty much to play Pearl cranked up to 40 freaking three. Because like Timmy's dad, Chris from Family Guy, and many, many other characters like this, the later season pretty much means take that one trait you're known for and push it up to uncharacteristically unrealistic limits. Also, Mr. Krabs says that he's getting Pearl a new mom instead of a mom. Maybe I'm just a nerd, but throw me a bone. Give me a hint as to what happened to Pearl's old mom. Just a suggestion. Show me me sweep up the cinders and that you won't let me go to the ball and then I'll never meet my prince starring you don't need to go to any balls because you're already acting nutty seriously what is pearl here why is she acting like this it's annoying enough for a kid to act this way but Pearl is depicted as being a teenager. It's just weird, and honestly, it's a major problem with this episode. I've could have gone without the interaction with season nine Pearl. I know screaming is her thing, but Krabs is usually a large part of why, and for good reason. Here, he's just being in love, and in his perspective, never really did anything morally wrong. So in my opinion, she comes across as bratty and unjustified at that. The pacing of all this works well though. The dialogue is good at the start. And also, let's talk about the animation. They clearly want to try out new things and not have things be on the level of Family Guy's stiffness. So after this okay conversation, Mr. Krabs hears a knock on the door and zooms past Pearl. Unless it's someone with money, it has to be Kashina. So we get to the best and worst of this episode. I, I don't really know whether it's so bad that it's good or that it's so good that it's bad because I laugh when I see this, but I don't consider it good. But at the same time, since it's positive, it has a lot of cons as well and I don't really know. It's also average because SpongeBob has never been so modern in this way before. Well, let me explain. Kashina and Pearl start to interact. Pearl is socially a brick wall, not letting Kashina in and not having an open mind. She's going into this with the predetermined thought that if she does actually try to have a relationship with this person, it can only lead to her being forced to work and not go to this ball. And then the following happens. Yo! Never understand me. In fact, I'm going to make it a point to never be understandable again. Blob double goober plab. Am I alive? Nope, I'm dead. Like, let me, let me. I, I don't feel a pulse. Yeah, I think I should be dead. I should be cremated. I'll relax once more. What is Pearl here? Why is this both funny and sad at the same time? If they did this with any other character, any other character. I would think it's terrible, but they did it with Pearl, one of the less damaged characters, and now this scene can be up there with Patrick the card scene, Larry the Lobster's raw protein scene, and Gary taking off his shell, where it only makes the character's actions or look extremely questionable. I understand that a normal conversation would have been boring and contradicted what I said earlier about SpongeBob the show, being able to do what they want, such as animation, but please, the other extreme is also there for a reason. So Kashina and Pearl decide to talk it out. They come back down and they're talking about suplexes and girl things. Okay. So Mr. Krabs decides to pop the question of marriage and of course she says yes. I wonder if interspecies marriage is a hot button issue. So from what is going to happen, I don't believe that in Married to Money, there is a trying to infiltrate the Krusty Krab scene as Kashina isn't trying to get the form 
formula in that type of way, so I decided to stop here. So out of them all, Grandma's Secret Recipe and Married to Money are for the most part tied as having the better disguised scenes. Married to Money was silly, but at the same time, not grounded enough for me to care. Pearl was acting very wacky, but sometimes too wacky isn't a good thing. In fact, since I don't really know if I want to truly knock Pearl's performance or not, it will just stay in this somewhat gray area. Grandma's Secret Recipe, while full of filler, was short and harmless. Hey, I didn't say they were good scenes, I just said they were better. Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy disguise scenes, while short, were average, and did not bring enough to the table to keep my interest. Showback shenanigans gets last because, as I said before, the pill scene. And everything in it is just part filler and part confusing. So as we return to Plankton's in the fursuit with the hairless goat, Plankton begins his side of the interaction with Sandy, which is 60% Doug Lawrence, voice actor of Plankton, pertaining to portray someone from Texas, 39.9% ignorance of the bikini bottom, and a very tiny 0.1 portion of comedy. In my review of Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy, this is where the meat of the episode will lie, which means the main pros and cons will generally come from here. But something about you is different. I just can't put my finger on it. Please don't put your finger on it. Well, they are special friends. But Spongebob doesn't realize that the empty fur carcass, for the lack of a better description, is Plankton in a Sandy suit. So this opens up many possibilities. Some would say endless possibilities. The writers of this episode decide to choose a whopping one possibility. Let's see if this one is great enough to carry out their entire episode. So they start off going back and forth in a really drawn out conversation. Also, should I question how Sandy got back there in the first place. But this is your old buddy Sandy Cheeks. Why you and me are as closer and two catfish in skillet. Uh, Sandy, section 9 number 34.44-929B specifically prohibits the disclosure of the secret formula to friends, even when those friends are, quote, closer in two catfish in a skillet. I will admit, that was pretty good. So instead of describing how to make the patty part of a Krabby Patty, SpongeBob would rather opt to show Sandy how to prepare the full sandwich instead. While doing this, Mr. Krabs places the secret formula in plain sight. For this episode standards, I guess it's okay. So since Mr. Krabs puts the secret formula in plain sight, letting SpongeBob defend it while in plain view of Plankton, this just makes it so much easier for him, right? Well, let's see after we get to these scenes. I just want to describe what happens in these scenes before I say what I say. So Sandy is seen in the outskirts of Bikini Bottom. I'm led to believe that she lives away from everyone. She tries to ask people if they have seen her suit and pretty much this happens. <laughs> Look at a naked chipmunk. What is so funny about getting my fur stole? Aren't you ashamed having your pink rat flesh exposed? Probably not. For the same reason, half of the Bikini Bottoms flesh is out and about and commonplace. So she decides to go into hiding and hide being sheer. It's not even that they laugh because she looks funny without fur. That would make sense. They are laughing because she's naked. We then go on to Plankton making efforts to get the formula. There's a progression, however, but the efforts gone through to get the formula stay the same. Imagine, if you will, that you're trying to get over a wall. Even in cartoon logic, you would raise the stakes in order to keep things interesting over time, right? Well, let's say you use a ladder, but you can't get over the wall because this ladder is too short. Would you then get another ladder that's the exact same size? No, because it didn't work the first time. And it leads to a very uninterested middle of the episode. However, I want to bring up this scene here. I'll let it play through for reference. That dastardly rustler's gotta be somewhere in these parts. Hey look, a hairless goat! Now I'm forgiving, very forgiving. I'm not gonna call out every inconsistency or animation error or missed opportunity, that's crazy. But every person has their limit. When you play a game or watch a movie or listen to a song, you don't wanna be taken out of the enjoyment of it because you found something in it that just doesn't make sense. I don't really see people bringing up this giant inconsistency of the show. You know, other than the fact that Sandy still has her suit, they blatantly switch backgrounds just 
has to have the cop shown, as well as having Sandy in front of this vent, just so that it can stop at the right time that the seaweed becomes brittle and cracks. It is a blatant change of the background, and serves as the cherry on top for what is an episode that will accept as much inconsistencies that it has, just to make it work on the bare minimum level. This has the professionalism of a first draft. This is initial storyboarding levels of cohesion. Other than the staleness of this episode, it is also very inconsistent. I do understand that the point of view comes into play, but here's a suggestion. Compare the two scenes before you move on. Make sure that the first scene and the second scene look like they come together. This is pretty much why 2D works so well. I know it's a challenge on like 3D environments where the environment will look just like how you think it would from every single angle, but for the figurehead of Nickelodeon, and a show that has been going on for a decade with tons of financial backing and experience. These little mistakes are inexcusable. So the town goes back to ridiculing Sandy and I get this weird vibe when I watch. Now the town is essentially one character and I completely understand why. This is something I feel when I watch episodes like Sun Bleach, One Course Meal, Sly Whistle Stooges, Little Yellow Book, Bro Jokes, Gone, and fun, where the entire episode revolves around the entire town running off or shunning a character or characters. However, it usually goes into a few categories for me. Fun, squirrel jokes, and gone work well with the concept, and I feel as though they do it in a very understandable way, even if I don't agree. Little Yellow Book and Sly Whistle Stooges and One Course Meal do this concept in a way that I understand what they wanted to attempt to do, but ultimately it falls flat. And then there's Sun Bleach in this episode, where the concept is used in a way that unfortunately makes me feel like a particular group isn't wanted, appreciated, or accepted there. Which you can fill in the blanks for yourself. Mind you, Sandy lives in an area where she has to go through the outskirts of Bikini Bottom in order to reach the Bikini Bottom. I'm not gonna accuse anyone of anything, but the way that the Bikini Bottomites act make unfortunate implications, is all I'm saying. SpongeBob and a frustrated Plankton are working on Sandy's bun placing technique. We could address your problem areas directly. Are you struggling with the final wrist flick? Or is your difficulty with the initial transfer move? I think it's on the last part where a yellow douchebag critiques me for being off a millimeter. However, if I were doing like a sins video or something, I would subtract five sins for showing that a high performance cook like SpongeBob does deliberate practice. Props. So then they show Sandy being the outcast of Bikini Bottom. What else is new? Skip. So now I'll move on to Grandma's Secret Recipe. Well now we get back and we see a much more direct attempt for Grammy Ma Sheldon to try and get into the Krusty Krab. He tries to lay it firm that he wants to visit Spongebob's place of work but Spongebob immediately blows him over. Actually, I'm pretty glad that they didn't enter the Krusty Krab immediately. This gives him a barrier and it allows for more creative ways to prosper. However, don't consider this high praise as I'm sure if they did head to the Krusty Krab, it would have been filler until they need to finish the episode. I don't really trust this episode to get better anytime soon. Surprisingly though, we do get some above average scenes from the old folks home. We also get to see some characters that we have seen before in other episodes such as the grandmother and Gary come home, and the lady who banned Krabby Patties for being fun and delicious. I do like all these scenes, and as usual, I don't want to spoil much. However, Grammy Ma's reactions are what make this episode. Why are you not having fun? Why? Because I don't knit, you nitwit! Are you sure? Because you make a real nice scarf! We also get a card game because this episode is trying to get in all of the grandmother cliches that it has. Grammy Ma then gets crabby because she's hungry. SpongeBob asks if she would settle for a Krabby Patty and he accepts, laughing maniacally. Again, like I said, Grammy Ma's reactions are what make this episode. Grammy Ma approaches the Krusty Krab with SpongeBob but explicitly tells him that she would much rather go through the back because she's shy. Once they go around to the back of the Krusty Krab, Squidward approaches them and Grammy Ma hides. So it appears that SpongeBob is going crazy, thinking someone is there, but they really aren't. Honestly, at this point, this episode is hitting its points in the most average and boring way. At least someone's in the kitchen with Sandy 
had something interesting to talk about. Squidward is also portrayed entirely calm. It's a nice change of pace. So they enter the Krusty Krab, and just like someone's in the kitchen with Sandy, Plankton is given a clear okay to get the formula. This time, Mr. Krabs doesn't leave the formula in clear view, but it's the same amount of carelessness. So Grammy Ma makes a Grammy Ma disguise, and as she walks off camera, it floats into the oblivion, or the kitchen sink, whichever makes more sense. Grammy Ma then looks under plates of dishes. The balloon makes its way to the kitchen sink. I guess they have since upgraded their sinks from Can You Spare a Dime? Sounds like there's something stuck in the chair. Grandma! Oh, I can't bear to look! <laughs> to his perspective, he did just see his Grammy Ma get mutilated, so I guess I can laugh because it didn't happen, but I'm contemplating how they would make an episode around this seem so dull. SpongeBob does great with old people. Mermaid Man, Barnacle Boy, even the Flying Dutchman. He's old, he's a ghost. But this is exactly as boring as it would be. Honestly, I'm trying to find anything, anything to say about this that would be interesting, anything I didn't already say. Because anything I didn't say probably was already covered in Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy or will be covered in another episode that does it in a much more interesting way. This is the heart of the episode and it seems very dull. It doesn't have the wacky fun or the comedy or even the decent storytelling to hold it as a good episode. It seems to be something that was forced. In fact, when we do come back to this episode, we will see that things can get even more dull, more contrived, more forced. So now I will switch over to shellback shenanigans getting into the Krusty Krab scenes. So now we see that Gary's coming back from vacation, which is weird because Plankton said one night. I guess this is just like the Loud House where nights move so fast that they don't even register as tomorrow yet. Gary, with this keen vision, notices an evil, conniving looking Plankton. And of course, thinks that he's up to no good. So he goes to check it out. Remember how I said this episode was nine minutes into a standard 11 minute episode? Well, that's pretty much the getting into the Krusty Krab part. Sorry for the shortness on this particular episode, but this time it was literally only one scene. So because of that, I guess this part was good. It is one drop of good in a bucket of mediocrity. So I wouldn't get too excited. So let's move on to Married to Money. So now we're back in what would be the getting in the Crust of Crab scenes, but really it's just the parts before it inevitably fails. SpongeBob is given the role of a wedding planner, and yet again, SpongeBob is the love master here. I do like the joke of SpongeBob telling Krabs that he's going to stretch the bill until it begs for mercy. I'm not sure how far I would take that joke though, and the wrong triggered hands, that could be taken the wrong way. So wrong that you would beg for mercy for being stretched. However, one thing they never distinguish is the fact that Kashina is sentient, yet none of Mr. Krabs' money is. So now, they go on a montage of working on the Krusty Krab, getting everything together for the wedding. It isn't anything special, really. Eugene, you have everything I ever wanted in a man. An exoskeleton, freakishly long eye stalks, and the secret Krabby Patty formula. Wow, that isn't on the nose at all. Even the bikini bottomites, or bottomers, don't take the skepticism to what she says. I'm not saying Plankton's plans have to foil early, but he should be more careful. Kishida, you came into my life when I thought I'd leave the rest of it alone. You showed me once and for all that while money can't buy you love, it can give you love. Wow, that was actually really good. I actually really liked the vows he gave. It was a great balance of wacky lines, but also taken very seriously, and it came off very professionally made. Good job, writers. Also, I'm getting huge True for Square vibes from this wedding. I'm just waiting for the one guy to shout BOO at the top of his lungs. I'm gonna skip the boat quit. I'm gonna skip the throwing flowers scene because talking about it would only bring up the argument that since Spongebob isn't based off of continuity, this doesn't matter. But it really bums me out that Puff can still want to be with Mr. Krabs despite his lifestyle. This wedding was amazing. In fact, it's probably one of the better scenes to come out of season nine. So I think it's obvious who I'd pick to be number one, Married to Money. Although Grandma's Secret Recipe comes in a close second. Those scenes at the old folks home were actually pretty funny. I really enjoyed Plankton's suffering for the chance of getting the formula. 
Show back shenanigans while short is way better than Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy. Notice how this episode here, Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy, is never really better than any of the other episodes on this versus. It's just not a good episode. In fact, when you compare it to Married to Money, I think Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy is what not to do in Married to Money is a step in the right direction so far. So we're back in Sandy's in the 1950s with Exclusion, Plankton pretty much starts off going off the deep end after Spongebob pretty much repeats the concept of missing by a minuscule amount. Aw, try again. Aw, try again. This is what they decided to spend their time on with this concept. Plankton decides to run off with the formula and magically, he can move this body with great skill. He gets approached by... Sandy? What I don't get is that before we got here, Sandy said the following. What am I gonna do? If I'm ever gonna catch this thug, I'm gonna need some help. Now, whatever that help was, was never shown on screen. It is almost as if they forgot. And before you say that the sewer was the help, she was already hiding. If that was the help, then her stating this was just stating the obvious. Obvious beatdown is obvious as Sandy gets her comeuppance. Take the sicko away! Actually, we're referring to you, ma'am. Public nudity is against the law in this county. And speaking of the obvious, <clears throat> you guys have seen her before this. Sandy has been outside like this, just with fur, multiple people in Bikini Bottom dressed the same, blah blah blah. Before I get to my final thoughts, I want to finish off all of the other episodes first, so let us get back to Grandma's Secret Recipe. Well, there is the safe where Mr. Krabs keeps the Krusty Krab secret formula that Plankton's been trying to steal for the past bunch of years. Oh, I don't think he'd mind if my dear old Grammy Ma rests in there. Wow, that was so believable. I did see that coming. That's exactly what I expected. See, this, like other episodes in this versus, is undercooked. They wanted to flesh out the idea of Plankton being a grandmother, but all they did was write down, make Plankton a Grammy Ma and fill in 11 minutes. Just like in one course meal, why does Spongebob have to be so direct when it comes to the secret formula or its location? Yet in Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy, he acts as if the secret formula is, well, secret. Major inconsistencies. Yay. Which adds up to an episode not really worth viewing again. We get a very long and drawn out monologue trying to be clever with its age. It's funny how Plankton feels alive when his dialogue seems very dead. I don't believe this. Is this idea really good? Or is this really hokey, cheesy, and underdeveloped? Plankton, the evil genius, who I might add, had a flashback that didn't even happen. He later gets confronted by his grandmother. How is it that Plankton, and yes I'm talking about the entire species, is able to get into the safe? If that's the case, why not just get the formula any way possible? This is what I don't understand. Plankton can never just get the formula, because that's the point. It's supposed to be for the chase. However, the chase is that instead of chasing the formula, he's chasing the chase of the formula. Let me explain. He made this scheme which is very inconsistent and I don't blame this on Plankton as a character. I blame this on the writing. There is many inconsistent things that draw me away from calling this a good episode but I will talk about those overall thoughts when we get into the end. So Plankton gets caught and dragged off. I guess his punishment is getting dragged off. Quick, call the government. Why are we waterboarding people when we can just drag them off? That'll show them. I'm going to assume that no one learned anything in this and this was just 11 minutes of watching Plankton play dress up. So let us transition into shellback shenanigans where we see how Plankton fails there. So Gary rushes after Plankton and beats up Plankton. I don't want to pad this out. He beats up Plankton and wins. But that isn't what's important here. In this episode, Plankton wants a Krabby Patty instead of the formula, which begs the question, what is the significance between the two? If you make crappy variations on both, which only serve to create this cliche in the first place. So Mr. Krabs gives Gary a job for pretty much sniffing out Plankton for the duration of the end of this episode. They also found out that Mr. Krabs doesn't like giving. It is at least an upgrade from the previous episode. So let me gather my final thoughts for this episode and let's switch over to how Plankton fails in Married to Money. So let us finish this already long verses. For all intents and purposes, Eugene Krabs and Sheldon Plankton are married. There is no ifs, 
and or buts about it. And it's also assumed, spoiler alert, that just like in Restraining Spongebob, there is no reset beyond the status quo as guide. So we get our newlyweds at the honeymoon hotel. All right, where are you going with this? Krabs brings Kashina into a hotel room and takes off his tie in the most suggestive way possible. I didn't think there was a suggestive way to take off a tie. Thank you for sharing that, Nickelodeon. I want you to tell me the secret Krabby Patty formula. The what? The secret formula is locked away in your heart. I wonder why this wasn't a red flag for Eugene, but I'm gonna chalk this up to love. So now we get one of the weirdest scenes of this episode and probably one of the weirdest scenes of season nine. Mr. Krabs, while in the process of getting ready to tell the secret formula, decides to tear up. I haven't seen him in True for Square tearing up like this. Of course, this exposes Plankton, which causes Krabs to get flustered but do nothing. Then in a twist of events, Krabs asks Plankton if he felt any true feelings for Mr. Krabs, which causes Plankton, a married and possible Possible heterosexual to blow him off. Krabs implies here in these last few scenes that he's so desperate he's even willing to consider the feelings of someone who only wants his formula. I understand slightly, but then again, I never really fell for a pile of money. They ended on a few jokes here and there, but honestly, it isn't anything truly remarkable for an ending. I will save my thoughts here, and let's go into the conclusion of all four episodes. This episode has a lot of major problems, which leads me to think of it as a poor episode. The inconsistencies take me out of the episode, especially when when a lot of them are forced and easily fixable. The fact that they thought that this concept was so groundbreaking that they had to repeat it more than once and still have so many stale moments is mind boggling. I don't want to look at this episode again and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. It's not a bad enough episode to be considered offensive, infamous, or even one of the worst, but it screams low effort, which is why a lot of people don't like the later seasons. I cannot see someone coming back to this episode and trying to pick up Spongebob again. This probably would be a prime example of why certain people don't like post-movie Spongebob, but in a more symbolic way. And as for the sandy parts, I'm indifferent to them. I don't know where my personal uncomfort starts and the objective part ends. I don't wanna comment on it any more than I did. As for Grandma's Secret Recipe, this episode is extremely boring to sit through and write for. Nothing truly exciting or memorable happens in it and it feels like an example to pad out the season. This episode just us very well may be the prime example of not only plot recycling, but blatant plot recycling to the point of being forced, inconsistent, and underwhelming. It is a shame too, because it had potential. I can see this concept going very well if they did more than the standard old folks cliches. In fact, the best parts of this episode were at the old folks home, both when Plankton was having a talk with his grandmother in the beginning, whether that was genuine or not, and when Grammy Ma was very crabby while playing cards and knitting and all of that. It only went downhill when it featured the sponge. And no, it's not only SpongeBob's fault, but he's a big reason why this isn't a good episode. This is all treated very realistically. Not to mention the concept as a whole, is simple and has a lot of potential, but the execution was so overcomplicated and tried to make a mountain out of a molehill. In simple terms, this episode is unoriginal, uninteresting, and not worth anyone's time. This episode was decent. Unlike in Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy, the episode doesn't opt to throw in bad comedy and easily noticeable inconsistencies. Like Grandma's Secret Recipe, this episode's premise has a lot of potential. I just wish that they did something with it beyond the whole extended hospital scene that took up way too much of the episode. I believe that although Plankton was the best part of the episode, in my opinion, it is always his interactions that really make the episode. The hospital's nurse was also a highlight, obviously. At least for me. The scene with the pill made me feel out of it. Yeah, that's what I come to SpongeBob for. Uncomfortable pill swallowing. The comedy was better than other episodes in this version and the storytelling was a hair's width past certain other episodes. But the pacing here is what kills it. I guess you can say its strength was clearly dialogue, but it wasn't enough to overshadow all of the flaws in this episode, such as the incredible amount of filler, which, like I said earlier, kills the pacing, which for an 11 minute episode is embarrassing and unacceptable. Married to Money was average. Between the good and the bad, it fortunately leans towards the good, but stays in the average. I cannot stand all of the cliches it uses. 
for being such a figurehead show and an inspiration for others. It should lead by example and move on from that. The ending was weird and implied things that I don't want to discuss in detail. Pearl largely was unnecessary and exaggerated to a point where I did not enjoy her presence. The story however was fleshed out and did give off a very fun mood. However it comes from a very overused concept which is why this verse exists. On the positive side the wedding was a very great scene minus the bouquet toss. I love the vows from Mr. Krabs. It seems very genuine and it came from a very nice place. This episode featured a very modern and fresh look for the characters, some of it good and some of it bad. I do think that this episode has a lot to improve on, but it's much better than its peers, and definitely better than its sister episode The Fishbowl, for those of you into Spongebob trivia. So how would I rank these overall? Someone's in the Kitchen with Sandy is number 5, Shellback Shenanigans is number 4, Grandma's Secret Recipe is number 3, Married to Money is number 2, and what's number 1? Imitation crabs. Now I know what you're saying. What? No fair because I didn't review it. Well, the entire point of this is that all of these episodes took the concept from Imitation Crabs. I remember Imitation Crabs after all of these years. And as I write this, I cannot remember more than a handful of things from Shellback Shenanigans. Sometimes revisiting old material can bring out wonderful things that you haven't experimented with yet, but not here. Nickelodeon? SpongeBob? It's time to stop this. One okay episode out of four is just not acceptable. I'd like for each episode to be at least decent. However, if this is the road you'll be taking in the later seasons, let me know. So I can not watch Spongebob if this is the examples of how you will execute it. Ugh. Well, guys, that was my mega verses. I think I'm gonna do a lot of smaller projects before I do the big 5-0. If you reached all the way here, I just wanna thank you. And now, I'm gonna relax. Always remember that I have a request video and it's always gonna be in the card of all of my future videos. And also check out the description. I have some very neat things in there that you might be interested in. So let me not waste any more of your time. As always, I hope your time is well spent. And Alpha, out. Also, in this scene, Plankton's grandmother falls asleep, then tells Plankton to get up, but do somewhat well with their time at the same I do enjoy small mounts, and pretty much stretches out the dr chalk this up to your Sandy Bob shipping for the select few of you. Or he's heading... So Plankton pretty much gets this, just like with the pickle peanut, when Squidward was reading the Spongebob's diary in, and pretty much stretches out the... That believes that children in general use the words cray k That believes that children in general use the words cray cray selfies and del- That believes that children in general use the words cray cray, selfie, and duck lips. <sighs> My body just won't let me say this. So Plankton pretty much gets this- So as he's moping, he hears a woman sobbing quite loud. Which is why instead of repeatedly- <sighs> It fortunately leads- so as he's sobbing, he hears a woman whoops, running a restaurant on borderline criminal. So SpongeBob makes a Krabby Patty for his special friend. Chalk this up to your Sandy Bomb shipping for running a restaurant on borderline criminal. This episode just very well may be a prime example of not only pro. I'm allergic to this episode.